so welcome everyone for our uh, session. So we'll be looking at DHS2 and uh, the country digital architectures. And so we'll have presentation from various teams. Yeah, from South Africa, also from West Africa. And also we'll have also a presentation from PEFA and also another presentation from Tanzania. And also the last presentation will be from Rwanda. And so the presentation will be around how different integrations and how uh, the different, uh, yeah, how, how the different implementations are, they fit in within the broader uh, systems architecture or the digital health architectures, maybe within uh, the, the, the countries they're implementing or, or within also the regional they're implementing in or within also the global uh, scale based on how the different uh, things are tied in. So we'll be able to, yeah, look and if you have any questions, uh, kindly just uh, we'll give you some time and you'll be able to respond. So uh, without much taking time, I'll inv invite the first presenters who will be able to start us off. Yeah, thank you, Sean and Anmar. All right, thank you very much. So Sean and Almarie will be doing this together. And those of you that were in the last session on AI will see that this is a little bit of an overlap from the AI machine learning session into, into architecture. So we're from HISP South Africa, which is by far the oldest and the largest HISP, which means we've made the most mistakes and we can tell you a lot about how not to do things and hopefully a little bit about uh, some of how to do stuff right. We'll start with this picture. Um, I studied medicine. Uh, is where I started my career and looking around the room, we're of a similar age, but there are a few that might have been in primary school when I studied medicine. And what's been very interesting for me over the years is to see how thinking around certain diseases has changed. So for example, when I was at medical school, we didn't know what caused cervical cancer. We knew women died from cervical cancer. We knew that it had something to do with having a lot of sex and the more sex you had and the more partners you had, the more you died of cervical cancer. But the idea that it was caused by a virus and that you could cure that virus with a vaccine and therefore women wouldn't die of cervical cancer was not part of our thinking in those days. So how did we get to figuring that out? Well, there were lots of randomized control trials and there was a whole lot of science in medicine that helped us get to that point. Now that's for a patient. If we thought, think about our health systems, in many ways, we wanna do the same. We wanna be able to understand our health systems in a way that we can manage our health systems better and make better choices so that our health systems get stronger. But a health system is not a person. You may have heard them described as com complex adaptive systems. And because they're so complex, you can't do a randomized controlled trial of health systems. So how do we start figuring out how to make better decisions about health systems? And I, I put this picture up. So South Africa has got a very diverse and varied landscape. You'll have some environments that look more like this and some environments that look more like, like Oslo. And yet across those environments, you need to start making decisions about what do I need to do in this health system that's going to work? What does this health system need today? And more importantly, what's this health system going to need in five or 10 or 20 years time? And this is where the technologies like artificial intelligence and particularly machine learning allow us to do some predictive work that can be, can be pretty powerful and help us hopefully start being able to diagnose what our health system needs before it needs it so we can take action. Right, so that's just the intro. These are the things we're gonna talk about. Um, I'll make some introductory comments and get into a little bit of architecture and then I'll hand over to Elmery and she'll get into an actual machine learning example. So part of what I started talking about in that introduction was, was this landscape that what we do most of the time with DHIS2 is somewhere around the bottom here. We look at what has happened and we try and understand why it happened we very seldom get into what will happen next and associated questions around, well, how can we make it happen if it's good and how can we stop it happening if it's bad? So we're largely stuck at this at the second step. And what we want to do is to get very much into those, into those next two steps. And what we believe absolutely is in the next decades, public health practitioners and people working with data like DHIS data are gonna be working at the top two steps, not at these bottom two steps, if we do our jobs right. So we're going to talk about a particular use case, which comes from our human resource information um, system project uh, in South Africa, where we built a, um, a health workforce registry. And then nine things we want to do in this use case. We've done the first two. It gives you a sense of, 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 uh, of how far we are, are on this. 
We started this journey more than two years ago where we decided data science was important to us. We needed to start thinking about artificial intelligence and machine learning. We needed to start employing the kinds of people that could do this work. And we spent the last two, two and a half years getting past those first two steps. So the big message for those of you that are wanting to get into these kinds of projects is start investing in people, start investing in getting the right sorts of people that are gonna be able to help you on this journey. And so today we, we'll talk a little bit about those first two steps and then uh, get in some, uh, into some of those next ones. So I'll spend a few minutes on this very busy architecture diagram because that starts speaking also to the, the core subject of, of this session. What we're also discovering is that our work with DHIS is so fundamentally different to what it was 10 years ago. Where 10 years ago with the DHIS alone, you could do a lot. You can still do a lot, but if you're wanting to get into the kinds of health systems planning and starting to prepare our health systems for the future and for the challenges that they're facing, there's a lot of other things you need to be doing alongside the DHIS. And so what this project around a human resource information systems recognized immediately was that the DHIS routine health information system data was going to be really important because we need to know where our burden is going to be, but it's going to need to be combined with a whole lot of other data. In the top box there, we need a lot of data that describes the health workforce. Who are our nurses? Who are our doctors? Where are they coming from? What's the pipeline like? How many are we training? How many started medicine this year? So in six, seven or eight years time, they're gonna be coming through. What, you know, what does that pipeline look like? So there's a whole lot of other data that we're gonna to need to pull, into our, to pull out into our environment. We won't go into all of those data sets. Once it's into that environment, then there are different things that we're gonna to need to do um, with that data. And the red boxes describe the work that we're doing around this specific use case, which is to look at attrition. And so the question that was asked for us asked of us with our uh, human resource information system is, is it possible to predict in five years time, one, where you'll need which categories of staff, but two, how those staff will be changing down to the point that if there's a nurse in a facility working in TB, what's the chance she's gonna be there in five years time? Is there a chance that she'll resign? down to the absolute specifics around specific categories in specific um, areas. And, 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 that's the, and that's the challenge that we face. Is this a good point for me to hand over to you? Do a bit more on the architecture? What? Thank you, Sean. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, as you can see, there's um, parts of DHIS2. We're including a fire registry, which looks at um, use the MCSD um, profiles for um, uh, for staff, and then uh, the, these red boxes are the HR is representing the HRH planner module that we sort of as a group, um, which enables um, the health manager uh, or the HR manager in, in the Department of Health to to plan for uh, universal health coverage. As you all know, that is the WHO uh, targets to achieve universal health coverage by 2030. And these components is what we have used in this use case to, to do the machine learning. Um, so that module is specifically used um, the, in, for the machine learning using Apache Python. Uh, the front end of that is a streamlit application, which we uh, can then allow users to run um, the backend uh, machine learning. And then we have analytics uh, feeding through um, a web portal, uh, DHIS web portal uh, through Apache Superset. Um, thanks, Sean. Um, so, in our machine learning model, we follow the quantitative approach of data collection or the raw data from DHIS2. We have uh, 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 HR and financial systems that dump uh, data onto a cloud um, environment. Um, we're using uh, PG Admin uh, and uh, to uh, a dimensional data model to uh, uh, extract that data out to store the data and we extract it from there. Uh, we uh, One of the big pro, uh, parts as well, um, more or less 60% of your work is cleaning that data, describing it, visualizing the data, 
understanding what data you actually have, and then to do the modeling um, uh, of the data, um, looking at the actual versus predicted data, and lastly, um, an, a deployment um, through pushing data that we have um, generated back into DHAs to, um, through Streamlit. Um, so, um, as you could see, one of the big things that we have done so far is we are able to predict who is going to leave the um, Ministry of Health employment in the next six months. Um, and we, what we are using for that is um, the active headcount up to the latest data, and we've got data for a, a few years, and we're using termination data from 2020, understanding um, why people left mainly looking at permanent employees because contractors leave because their contract ends. So that's not really a, giving us a, a reason why, and, and you don't intend to keep them, but other people, are they leaving because they resigned, because they were uh, disciplined and fired, or they might have retired or died or whatever. Um, and we're looking then at, at all levels of termination, voluntary and involuntary. And we also look at the educational level of the employees that uh, are leaving. Um, the source systems, we are taking that from our HRH data, education data that we have, modeling it through the Streamlit and Python tools, and then uh, use Superset for data extraction and for data visualization. Features, uh, looking at uh, demographic information of the person, their job information, job title, the reasons for their termination, and where they are actually located. Um, and then uh, for the machine learning, we're using um, machine learning algorithms, which I'll talk about now more, and advanced statistical anal analysis. So um, what we have done is, uh, in our model accuracy, random forest and logistic regression was fitted, and below are the results for both models. So the random forest was 81.9%, uh, and logistic regression performed better and was used for this modeling. Um, so what you can see here is the features of importance um, in the highest drivers of deciding whether you will uh, a person will churn or not. So age, employment title, the tenure, how long they have been in employment, the turnover rate, the salary level, number of qualifications, and so on, up to um, race, gender, race, and country of citizenship being less um, important in deciding whether people would uh, churn. So from the uh, Streamlit app, um, it allows you to filter uh, different predictions and deciding what you want to filter on, and um, also basically uh, tuning um, your results in terms of precision, ensure that you don't overfit the model. Um, and then you can see here just a screenshot of the results. So we've taken out the individual's um, identifying information, but basically we then get a list such as this to say that these uh, individuals are likely to churn in the next six months. We do this on a monthly basis and give that to the, to the Ministry of Health. Um, so what we will do now is to also, now that we are able to show them this, we are, we are able to convince the Ministry to give us longer data back than 2020. Um, for us to um, uh, act more accurately predict. Um, so, and we are making this list of uh, high attrition probability available for the provinces to work with. And that list can be used to, uh, for ret uh, retention interventions. Um, contacting these people, finding out, maybe doing surveys, satisfaction surveys, or else planning for replacement of those if it's going to be um, basically unavoidable that they they um, change. So in the Brunelanga province, we have uh, done a visit to them and there are um, also specific data quality improvements that we have been able to work with them on, um, on 
so that the, the data is better. Sometimes they don't capture the reason for leaving. So, or um, the, the HR system, some the data is quite poor. So in looking at, at the output of this, we are also feeding back um, better data quality into it. And now uh, we are starting to work with them on expanding the model to include what is their current staffing needs for universal health coverage. Our next steps is um, to maximize the attrition benefits through looking back and then these interventions and measuring the impact of those interventions, then to determine the current needs for UHC coverage and predict the future needs for UHC coverage. Um, that is essentially the, the big part of the presentation. Here is a user satisfaction survey uh, chatbot code that we use on all of our systems where we um, uh, survey users to see are they happy with the performance of the system, the, um, how the system, uh, uh, how easy it is to use. So um, you're also welcome to run through that if you have Telegram installed on your phone. Um, and that is essentially our presentation. Yeah, so uh, we just need to thank uh, one of our colleagues who's online, uh, Christopher, who's done a lot of the technical work behind that. So well done, Christopher, if you can, if you can hear us. Um, and what we believe is this is one tiny little use case that is going to begin to be part of a whole collection of use cases that are going to be part of how we intervene very directly in our health systems. Instead of trying to guess at very large generic programs, we're going to get down to very specific information like Elmer is likely to leave in six months and what am I going to do about it? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sean and, and Marie, for the presentation. So as we set up the next presenter, Damola Sheriff from West Africa Health Organization. Yeah, so we can maybe take one or two questions as they set it up. Any question? Yeah, one question. Yeah, one question. Yeah, yeah. So this is to something you mentioned very early on in the architecture is a uh, triggering word for me is MCSD. Um, so how are you using that in your architecture and do, how did it play out into the learnings that you had there? Was there any correlation or just something that was available in DHS2 that you leveraged? So <clears throat> the um, uh, HRH registry um, is set up with MCS, using MCSD pro, uh, profiles for practitioner and practitioner role. So uh, because of that, we are able to interface with other systems that need to use um, a um, provider registry in a sense. So, um, and the, the, the bigger aspect of this um, HRIS system is to have not just the Ministry of Health data, but to be a um, a comprehensive uh, and a, a resource of all um, HR data. So it's part of the architecture in terms of individual data. So we don't have the individual data in DHIS. The DHIS stores the aggregation, aggregated results. Um, so that's how those profiles went into the into a fire registry. Yes. Thanks. We can start. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I think so. This is working now. It's going. It's okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, the, we are coming from West Africa. Uh, ECOWAS, that means Wahoo is uh, West African Health Organization. So. We, I just want to invite you to see this presentation, follow this presentation, not only in context of one country, because as the colleague are just uh, showing us now what is happening in one country. So that's a Wahoo or in the ECOWAS community is among 15 ECOWAS countries. That's a, all these 15 countries, how to put the system. Uh, and this experience was requested from for, for us when the with the experience, very bad experience with Ebola in 2014, 2016. And then the Minister of Health asked Wahoo to put in place one platform that can 
allow any country to know what is happening in terms of the epidemic situation, the uh, epidemic prone disease to, to, to be put it in place. And the challenge is so how to work with the different 15 countries that need to build their own system to put uh, work and then how the regional system can be bullied on that data. So that architecture, this thinking, the experience we will be showing you here, analyze it in this regional context, not in one country. That's what the more you can go. Okay. Thank you, Tome. Oh, yeah. So um Tome just described who we are. Um in summary, um this is the outline of our presentation. Uh ECOWAS is 15 countries, approximately 400 million people, single economic block, and we have free movement of people. So epidemics happening in one country is usually not limited, as Tommy said, uh, from my experience with the Ebola. It quickly spread across uh, four to five countries. Um, we we're given a mandate to set up a regional platform so that countries can know what is happening in the region. And the objective of our regional platform is to enable timely access for health data in the region uh, to all our stakeholders. Um, after the mandate was given to us to put in place the platform, uh, we had a lot of try and error failures along the way. And over time, uh, we learned and we took all these lessons and we finally adopted DHIS2 as a platform for the regional data warehouse um, in 2014. And since 2014, we've been building on this platform, um, even building things like public dashboards and everything on this platform um, towards our internal objective of having like a regional health observatory for the ECOWAS region. So this is where we want to go. So we want to have like, we want our regional platform to be part of our information systems architecture, where we have data coming from the countries, from external data sources, and passing through data pipelines, uh, formatting them for ingestion into the regional data warehouse, which is based on DHIS2. And in the future, having things like uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence based on the data we have, and also having things like Data Explorer for the for researchers and other people, and also being able to store unstructured data um, in a way that is accessible to our stakeholders. And we want to we want this platform to be a collaborative platform for our member states, and to enable timely availability of quality data and for us to be able to develop health information products to communicate situations to our stakeholders. We just don't want to collect data. We want to be able to process the data, analyze the data, and communicate back um, to our stakeholders. So um, in order to do this, we collect uh, for epidemic prone diseases, we collect data for epidemic prone diseases from member states. And we have a lot of challenges with that. And one of the challenges we have is that we used to collect it manually. The people have to log in from the 15 countries weekly and enter the data manually. And we know that our countries have internal systems for information systems management. So we started talking with them how we could get this data um, into the regional platform by minimizing uh, manual processes. And we discussed with them about interconnection and everything, but there were a lot of concerns. And one of the primary concerns was privacy and data sharing concerns. Like on what framework will this be built upon? And who is going to take responsibility? There's a problem. So there was, there was a lot of skepticism from the countries and we had to do a lot of advocacy to, 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 to bring them on board, especially in terms of um, the buying. Then um, another challenge was, sorry, can you go back? So another challenge was in terms of the manual data reporting systems, there are a lot of turnover at the country level. So the person entry data can be reassigned tomorrow and we won't get data from a particular country. And finally, um, even if we're going to do like an automatic integration, Different countries were using different systems. Um, three major systems are SOMAS, DHIS2, and MACPI, like totally different systems for information management at the country level. 
So one of the, so for these challenges, what we did was to address the challenges one by one. For the concerns, we developed a data governance policy at the ECOWAS level because in terms of mandate, we have a mandate to collect data. So the concerns of the country was how are we managing the data? So we, de we developed an internal data governance policy for WAO that specifies how WAO will collect the data, how we we'll use the data, and how we we'll disseminate the data, and how we we'll secure the data at the regional level to assuage the concerns of the member states and other stakeholders. And in terms of the automatic process, we realized that we cannot just jump from manual to a fully automatic system. So we developed this, uh, like we call it semi-automatic. Basically, the countries compile Excel sheets somewhere every, every week. So we built an app where they just upload the Excel sheet and we extract that into the DHIS. But that still wasn't, you still needed someone to go and upload an Excel sheet. So, and finally, uh, we developed like a, a completely automated process. And the process we went through is we did like a review and assessment of the tools of our capacity internally at WAO. And we decided on a particular framework we're going to use and also platform and everything. So the platform we use is Apache Airflow. And what we did was we set up the Apache Airflow and we did um, what we call operationalizing. We call the countries for like um, a regional meeting in batches, batches of five because there are 15 of them. And at this meeting, we created what we call mappings, org unit mappings between the org unit at the country level from the district um, and the regional platform. And we did the data element mapping from what they call data element, whether they call it indicator data element, whether they call it survey, survey line in, in MacPy or whatever platform they were using. And when we add this mapping, we were able to create um, like DAGs. Uh, Airflow has this concept of DAGs where you write the code for execution. And these DAGs is customized for each of the countries based on the, on, on the mappings. And after that, uh, we execute it. And one of the reasons why we set it on Airflow is that Airflow gives us instrumentation capacity. We can see when the automatic process has run, how long it took, whether it failed, why it failed, uh, how often it fails, and whether we need to do something about that. And basically, this is the process I just described. Um, so for each DAG, we fetch the country data, we load the mapping for that country, we load the data elements mapping for that country, we do some merging, and we format it in DHIS2 import format. We send it to the DHIS2, and we log what whether failures or successes, and that's the end of the process. So then we have agreement to member state on when these DAGs can run. So right now, for uh, automatic for data transfer in the ECOWAS region for epidemic prone diseases, this is our overall architecture, overall data flow. So we have 13 of our 15 countries sending well we are pulling data automatically from 13 of our 15 countries weekly at different days of the week this is based on agreements we have with them and two other countries are still using the old semi etl process where they upload excel sheets on our platform so and at the end of the week we have um, almost all the data from all the countries and our problem is no longer data set completeness it's usually more about data element completeness um so uh based on this information um that is now on our platform we're able to now build public pub, public public dashboards and other information products that we use to communicate with the general public so these are two examples that we'll put in our presentation we have the outbreak dashboard which shows for covid 19 data from 2020 to 2023 we have for the other ideas are ideas are um epidemic prone diseases, cholera, anthrax, AFP polio, and the likes. So for the next steps, um, we're trying to scale up this process to other programmatic areas like HIV and tuberculosis, like program data from the countries. We want them to be reporting automatically. So this is more or less like a pilot for us to see if we can do the, if we can solve the human problem and the technological problems 
then we can now re replicate this same process with the programmatic area. So we're currently working on malaria, nutrition, and eye health. So uh, So we're working with all, all these people, trying to bring the data into the regional platform, and also looking for how we can bring even survey data from public data sources. Because for us at the regional level, we are not really um, tracking uh, program indicators. So we are more or less trying to see uh, information and extract information for policy action and policy intervention at the regional level. So there are a lot of information out there, um, survey data, uh, socioeconomic data, and all of that. So we're trying to see how we can bring all this as well using this uh, platform into the regional data warehouse so that uh, when our statisticians internally need information, they don't need to be doing manual data extraction. So with the internal analytics capacity of the DHIS2, they can be able to do some basic analysis, then extract data for further analysis in a simpler way. Uh, in conclusion, so even though our countries all use different systems internally, they all have different administrative processes internally, we've been able to make progress. At least 13 of the 15 countries are connected automatically. And this has set the stage for us to one in the surveillance system, build a digital early warning system, because we are going to continue to work on this while we scale the other areas. So we're we are, we are going to work on this to do automate, automated notifications so that when a district in the cross-border area reports some suspected cases of uh, epidemic prone diseases, we can notify neighboring countries to just to take notes. Because right now this is done manually, but since we have this data now, we can automate all this process. So this is the next step for us. So I want to say thank you, Merci, obrigado. Yeah, one, one of the points we need to take in consideration, this thank you, merci, obrigado. This is line to say, so in this context of regional, any sentence you are writing, uh, working at request, you need to be sure so you are writing in three languages. Yeah, because yeah, three we words. have three speaking the, uh, different language. That's so, so anything we need to do it three times. So be sure so you go in. That's so, thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. So we'll have Vlad being set up as we take one question. And also if you have any question, you can write it down and we'll be able also to uh, have it and you can easily also be able to reach out to them. Anyone with a question before we have the next presenter? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, let's just give it to him. Thanks. So, so you mentioned there are 13 countries that are contributing data to the system itself. Um, from your workflow, it looked like you took the responsibility of connecting to those systems and pulling data out. Is there an agreement with the providers of those systems to maintain your ability to have access to that? Or are you working to a common format? What happens in three years time when SOMAS upgrades? How are you planning for that? So one of the things we discovered during our initial assessment is that the capacity at the Ministry of Health keeps changing and fluctuating. So we can't depend on that. So it's easier to build this capacity at the regional level and maintain this capacity in terms of technical capacity to do API implementations, for example. So when it changes, our team will do the technical work to make sure because the connection will fail. So we'll go see why it has failed we we'll call the countries and we we'll call the country and we we'll try to work with them. We we'll fix it. So and we also we also have forums where like we meet with the countries every year. Next week we are going to meet with all the all our fifteen countries in Ouagadougou. Um, later this year we will meet with them again. So we usually meet with them. So when things are changing at the operational level, we are keeping track and we keep contact with the new people. We also have a WhatsApp group that we used to communicate uh, information with the countries and they also used to communicate back with us. So it's a combination of people, processes and technology. Thank you. So, so we just take and, uh, and maybe we can respond. 
Yeah, thank you for the presentation. So I'm quite uh, interested about the regional agreement and the, the policy you develop. So the current data that has been shared within the region, is it uh, indicators like statistics or is including the individual like a case data or how does it uh, relate it to the, the whole IHR focal point and uh, yeah, how, how, how does it uh, relate? Thank you. And the, and the data, the hosting is where? <laughs> In less than 30 seconds. Okay, now you, now you got me confused. <laughs> um, let me take the last one first. Uh, the Austin Wow has um, its own data uh, that um, server center in Burkina Faso. There, we also have cloud providers. Uh, we use Etna um, in the European Union because the European Union GDPR is a bit compatible with our data protection policy that we have at WOW. Then in terms of the data we collect, it is aggregate data, it's not patient level, individual level records. But the protocol that sets up our institution is based on a treaty among the 15 countries. So it's very strong. So even in the future, if we want to go to that level, we can go there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Use that one too. Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Vlad Chiyoshvili. I'm with the ICF I'm supporting PEPFAR. Um, and I hope all of you are familiar with what PEPFAR is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, everyone likes to ask that. Uh, it used to stand for Inner City Fund, but it's just an acronym these days that's known as ICF only. We're just a contractor on the PEPFAR uh, program. All right. Uh, so, um, with the South Africa and ECOWAS, it's, it's actually like one level higher. So we started with the national, we went to regional, and PEPFAR is a global um, program. So it is HIV uh, mainly, so we don't do a lot of different disease areas, but it is a global uh, epidemic that we're trying to fight, and PEPFAR needs a lot of information in order to make decisions um, in this uh, process. So... Uh, as part of this decision-making process, we need to get the data from the host countries. And a lot of times what happens is that uh, the data is re uh, reported to the ministers of health, to PEPFAR, to other different organizations. And there's a lot of duplication of the data reporting. And um, we don't want to ask people to report the same data many, many times. So we have this collect once, use many times paradigm that we're trying to push forward and uh, the DA is really a, um, a view of national programs trying to figure out you know what's happening within each of these countries. Uh, PEPFAR supports over 70 countries. However, you know for the MOH alignment, we started small. We started uh, a little over five years ago with 11 uh, countries from the PEPFAR priority list. Uh, PEPFAR priority country list is 23 countries, which make about, um, I think, 80 over 80% of PEPFAR support. Uh, and now we support 23 countries through the, the uh, DA alignment. Uh, the short term goal was to uh, take the data, identify the reporting challenges, where the discrepancies are between what the Ministry of Health has in their uh, data reporting versus what PEPFAR gets directly from the partners that uh, support PEPFAR. And then to use this data to improve the processes and the overall program efficiencies. Uh, the long term is, you know, to actually take the data from MOH uh, instead of collecting the data directly from partners. So as a part of this MOH alignment activity, there is some uh, parallel reporting. Uh, there's a system to system and electronic exchange of data as part of MOH alignment. So we're not asking people to manually enter data twice. But what we're trying to do is find this uh, flow so that we can replace the reporting to PEPFAR directly with the data being sourced from ministries of health. Uh, so I'm just going to do a non-diagram overview of architecture. Uh, a lot of the thing that ECOWAS uh, mentioned actually applies to us as well. We're doing something very similar. Uh, we went for DHS2 platform for a couple of reasons, uh, main being that we already use DHS2 platform for Datum, which is our big uh, uh, hub for report, uh, get, collecting the MER data, which is the HIV indicators. But we also have other data streams that are all collected uh, in Datum. Uh, people are familiar with it. 
uh, not just our users, the PEPFAR users, but also the Ministry of Health user, uh, users and others. And uh, DHS2 is quite mature when it comes to aggregate data collecting. You know, the other um, parts of DHS2 might not be as good, but the aggregate is definitely there. And thanks, Lars. Uh, but it cannot do everything. I know, you know, DHS2 is supposed to be a Swiss Army knife, but it's not. Uh, so in order to achieve some of the shortcomings with uh, other global goods to supplement those. So Echo was mentioned facility uh, list harmonization. We have the same issue. You know, we have our DHS2 with those 70 countries. We have our unique identifiers for all those facilities. Ministers of Health that have their DHS2 with their unique identifiers. Names don't always match because sure, there's a master facility list, but does everyone actually always use the master facility list? Uh, so what we did is we used a uh, global open facility registry, Gopher tool, which uh, actually is a global good developed by IntraHealth, which uh, bolt on into DHS, so to say, uh, there's an app that you plug in into DHS2, it uses the metadata from DHS2, and it allows you to do side-by-side -side comparison, and then mapping of the facilities so that you can use um, later this mapped data to do the data ATL and then reporting. Similarly, we have metadata that needs to be mapped, similarly to ECOWAS. Uh, for that, we use Open Concept Lab, the OCL, the terminology service. Um, but OCL, when we started using it, didn't have any front end that would be easily usable in our environment. So we actually used the DHS2 platform to create an application, which is another feature of DHS2 that makes it easy to use it. Uh, and then there are backend processes. The OCL, for example, it's not just the front end. It does require backend integration. There is the metadata mapping uh, OCL integration, Gopher integration. And in order for, to do all of this, we use OpenHIM and the custom mediators to do this. Uh, I know uh, Route API is coming to DHS too. So we probably will look at it if we can replace it because, uh, yeah. There is a reason to scale down if it's possible. So if you have a new feature that can replace a uh, the system that's sitting there, why not? You know, just use one system. And then we also do analysis outside of DHS2 as well. Again, DHS2 can do a lot, but not everything. So we use R Shiny, where uh, users are able to uh, look at the data from a perspective that is not available in uh, DHS2. So uh, we have a facility level data. So it's pretty granular. Uh, there is and a smaller set of indicators, we don't do a lot uh, for this activity, but you want to do comparison side by side and uh, R Shiny, which is a web version of our code, uh, gives us that. And then I popped in the OHIE architecture diagram there. I don't know how many of you are familiar. I hope all of you are. Uh, so. Obviously, we don't use every single icon on there, but uh, the ones that we're using are basically there. There's the interoperability through that green bar. There is the HMIS. There is terminology service. There's facility registry and so on. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is just a screenshot of the apps we developed. So we have that in a, a indicator mapping app. We have the Gopher. Uh, there is the import app that is used to upload the data. There is the dashboard that we use for uh, monitoring what's happening with each of the countries. And, you know, these are all running within the DHS too. So, you know, people do not have to use multiple different platforms to do all of this stuff. Um, and this is really the, the only slide I have left. I'm trying to make this short, but, you know, there is lessons learned in this process, obviously. Uh, PEPFAR is data hungry. We do like a lot of data, unfortunately. Uh, I know the first year I came here, Kali was in the room and, you know, like how much more data do you guys want? Uh, but, you know, uh, to make decisions, you know, uh, you unfortunately need data. And if, uh, for example, you're treating HIV for decades, the age bands now that you want to access get finer because now there are people above 50 years that are living. And in order for you to actually address the issue, you are not satisfied with 50 plus to, to group them all together, right? You want 50, 55, 55, 60, 60, 65. And 
you know, you introduce that, that means you're introducing new data points, uh, new metadata. Uh, but just saying that I want, you know, 9,500 uh, age band because you think you need it is not a good idea, right? You start with analytics and you go backwards saying like, what do I need from the analytical perspective to drive what the metadata is so that I don't just ask for 100,000 different data points and I only really need five. Uh, so multinational program, you know, like regional program, multinational program requires unique approach. You know, you need to actually collaborate with all the different players. It's not one country where you have one ministry of health saying that, you know, you do this. Uh, different countries have different timelines, they have different processes, that have different maturity uh, levels. Some are technical savvy, some are not, you know, some need a little more uh, support in this process. Um, some have data at much higher granular level, some don't. Uh, so that goes into my next one, the data. Uh, but there needs uh, to be a validation process because you're getting data from different sources. Uh, validation is important so that you just don't end up with garbage. Uh, if you just allow anyone, you know, 23 countries to send whatever, then you lose the picture of things. Uh, and as I said, flexibility is necessary. You have different countries with different timelines, different technical skills. So. Uh, as you ask for more data, you need to re realize that you cannot be inflexible. Uh, and then communication and capacity building is the key. So support the teams that give you data so that they'll be happy and you'll be happy. That's it. Oops. Thank you, Vlad. So we can take a question as we set up the next presenter. A question here. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. So uh in terms of the metadata from PEFBAR, uh, has it been like published? And then in terms of the granularity, is it down to like data element, the most atmosphere, I mean atomic level of data element? And you mentioned about uh originally thinking about the OCL, but now it's uh, not. But uh where will this metadata be hosted? Because I think within the country we do, I, I know the pain. <laughs> like uh, whenever PEFA got a new requirement and then we have to try to configure it. So if, if it's possible to automate the whole process and we can generate whatsoever people want and that will help a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joseph. Uh, all right, I'll try to answer that quickly so that Zaharani has a chance to uh, continue. Uh, so. The MOH alignment indicators are actually quite limited, so it's not as bad as PEPFAR. You know, PEPFAR has hundreds of data elements and uh, thousands of category option combos. Uh, for MOH alignment, we only have seven indicators that we collect, and they're all published. So I can give you the link if you want. The OCL has metadata sharing platform that's out there. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it. I know in Malawi they were demonstrating. Uh, John was there, and uh, John. Um, uh, it is machine readable, so if you want to use OCL, you can definitely get the PEPFARs, both the MER and the Ministry of Health Alignment uh, indicators. They're all out there. Yeah, the data element category option combo and indicator. So the metadata sharing platform is uh, this really cool thing that they've developed where it's actually, if you take the MER guidance, that PDF, it's actually in a form where you can use it almost like a wiki where it links uh, and you can see the connection between different indicators and what data elements make up an indicator. Vlad, so we'll continue on and also at the end also we'll have, uh, uh, we are doing well with time, so we'll have some time for questions. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. Hello? Yeah, so my name is Zaharan Kalungwa. I'll be presenting um, uh, this presentation, Improving Disease Surveillance Data Availability in Zanzibar through integrating EADSR with HMIS. Uh, maybe I should speak about Zanzibar. Uh, Zanzibar is a semi-autonomous uh, region um, in Tanzania. Uh, Tanzania is um, a union of two countries, Tanganyika and Zanzibar. 
but Zanzibar is uh, semi-autonomous, meaning like they have their own Ministry of Health and other ministries, only few ministries which are like the union ministry. So Zanzibar, they have their own Ministry of Health. So I'll be speaking about Zanzibar today, not like Tanzania United Republic, but only Zanzibar. Um, so my name is Aran, as I said, I work with CDC Tanzania, uh, but I'm lucky to be presenting on behalf of uh, uh, Minister of Health Zanzibar today. So for this project, uh, these are the collaborators. Um, we have um, uh, Minister of Health Zanzibar, which provided overall leadership in implementation of the integration between Yadisa and HMIS. And we are here, CDC, Tanzania, we provided technical lead and advisory uh, in the implementation. And then we have uh, MDH, which is an implementing partner uh, funded by CDC. Uh, they are doing uh, coordination and on the integration between EADSR and HMIS. But then also we have uh, UDSM, uh, their technical development partner. And luckily, we have a representative from uh, uh, University of Dar es Salaam, who are the technical implementing partner. So if there's any technical question, I'm well covered because Joseph will be able to respond to them. So the background of how this ca came about. Um, so the revolution government of Zanzibar uh, has adopted WHO IDSR third edition, uh, which required um, immediate reporting of epidemic prone diseases or condition. Um, so before, before the new improvement of EADSR, Zanzibar was only reporting aggregate data weekly. Uh, they had 36 diseases, uh, which they were reporting weekly, but only aggregate. Um, so however, the, before the petition reporting, weekly aggregate data was conducted through HMIS system. So they use the normal HMIS system for them to be able to report. They didn't have, the epidemic unit didn't have their own system for them to be able uh, to report. So as I said, they had 36 diseases and condition were aggregated and reported in HMIS weekly uh, from the paper registers. But then uh, they opted to develop electronic integrated disease um, surveillance system and response uh, in 2019, uh, following the COVID-19 outbreak. And it was funded by USCDC through partner MDH uh, because of the need of immediate case-based case reporting for epidemic prone diseases. Um, it was aimed to address the scarcity of surveillance data previously collected as aggregate and entered manually in the HMS system. Um, but then also the need for the weekly re aggregate reporting to HMS was still requirement by Minister of Health Zanzibar because uh, there are two units within the ministry. One was uh, HMIS, which they have the mandate to report uh, weekly data, but in aggregate form. But then also there is um, an epidemiology unit which they needed for some is, uh, diseases, 26 of them, um, to be able to report immediately in case base. So they were like conflict between the two. Uh, because HMIS was saying, uh, if you are not going to be able to report to us uh, on aggregate for these six re uh, diseases, then we don't need to support, we are not going to support you developing uh, the EADSR, which is case-based. Uh, so then like they had to find a way for them to be able, uh, for this uh, HMIS to get the information, but also um, epidemiology unit to be able to monitor and also to, to detect these other diseases by case, uh, case base. So this, that's why they, they, they had to work on the integration between EADSR and HMIS uh, for critical to ensure that the automated process of aggregate weekly reporting from EADSR to HMIS for all 36 diseases and improve the quality of data. Then that's why uh, this project came around. So the methodology, the first initial engagement of all stakeholders, because there are so many stakeholders within that, you have HMIS, you have um, 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 ZSU, which is an epidemic unit, and then you have uh, malaria, you have RCH, all of them, uh, they needed to have this initial engagement for them to be able to agree of what is going to happen. And then also they had to identify key data element, uh, and then they did uh, mapping between EADSR and HMIS, uh, but then also they had to do mapping uh, on facility, uh, facility lists, because HMIS was using different facility lists, but then also EADSR was also using different facility lists. Uh, luckily, they had a Zanzibar Health Integration uh, Interoperability Layer, which was already developed, uh, but then they had to agree on the payload, etc. Uh, and the architect, 
The diagram shows the architect where one party of EADSR, but lucky for them, both systems were using um, DHIS2 platform. For EADSR, they're using both um, tracker as well as the aggregate uh, reporting, which was there. Because for 26 re, uh, diseases which were immediately reportable, they are reporting as case. So they are using tracker. But then within the, the system, they are also reporting on the weekly for seven uh, diseases as as aggregates. So they had to use both. But luckily for them, but both HMIS and uh, EADSA, both of them are using um, uh, DHIS2 platform, which was made a bit easy for them to do the integration. And then the integration layer, we're using op open him. Um, and one, luckily also, one of the use cases was uh, integration between ADSR and HMIS. So the results, they managed to do the integration through the uh, ADSR, uh, through the ZHIL. And for, so far, 21 weeks, 21 weeks worth of data has been submitted. Uh, about 326 data points are updated weekly across the 374 facilities. They, they all facilities in Zanzibar. They only have 374. Uh, and about 135 data points evaluated from immediate reportable data through program uh, indicators. And then reporting of immediate cases in ADSR is automatically sub submitted to HMIS on a weekly basis. They no longer need to do the manual um, aggregation and then uh, submitting it manually. So in conclusion, um, we found that the system integration is critical for improvement of health services in Zanzibar. Uh, the automation ensure the accessibility of accurate data because before people do it manually, then you are not even sure of uh, how accurate your data is. Um, but also integration can also potentially improve work efficiency because people now spend less time on the doing the aggregation and the reporting manually. Uh, it also reduces the cost since it eliminates manual review and entry of data. Uh, as the integration improves, these benefits are expected to be realized in, in Zanzibar. Uh, Asante Sana. Um, so the team, I would like to thank the team, uh, the MOH team in Zanzibar, uh, CDC, uh, MDH, and also DHIS2 UDSM team uh, implementer. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Zaharani, for showing us how yeah, data has to fit in in the country level architecture. So we'll take a couple of questions uh, before we set up the other presenter. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And it actually shows how difficult uh, data reporting in countries. So I just want to know now, you have successfully um, trying to integrate EIDSR uh, which has case-based data and the aggregate data of HMS. But at the end of the day, all these cases are generated at the same health facilities. You see the cases which are aggregated come into a particular administrative level and a healthcare center, maybe a primary or secondary. And then they're the same cases that, you know, get uh, details in the, in the case investigation forms, whether they're measles or polio, et cetera. So uh, at, the, at the health facility level, how does reporting happen and why people cannot report aggregated data at the end of the week to the same system and uh, uh, case-based data to the same system. So there's no need to uh, integrate at a higher level. Thank you very much for that question. So basically, uh, the way it has been implemented, uh, everything happens at facility level. So the immediate case-based reporting is done at facility level. They, wherever there's a case which there's a disease or condition which need to be reported immediately, they have tool within the facility. Uh, they have Android app. They report that notification to them. Uh, to the higher level, they do other other things to confirm that, like yes, there's this disease. Uh, so once that happens, it goes to the different levels. So what is happening now? The facilities are not required to report to the HMIS the aggregate number. The system, um, the, the integration, it does that aggregation for them, and that information is being sent to the HMIS from the facility itself. 
because that process is done automatic instead of doing the, the paper based and then like reporting again. It's, it should be the lubricate if you do that. And they didn't want that to happen. So they do everything in the facility using the tool which has been developed. And then the tool every Monday, they, it does the aggregation for them and it sends that aggregate data to the, to the HMI system. So they're no longer uh, required to report for those 26 uh, 36 uh, diseases or conditions, they don't need to do the, um, the manual process of reporting. It's just like the system does it for them. Star, a quick question. So when you uh, report case-based data, is it a probable case or a confirmed case? Uh, because uh, then the, the counts differ. Thank you. Okay, so um, for HMIS, uh, when they were before, before the EADSR, they used to have EADSR, but aggregate form, meaning that like they had module within uh, HMIS, they call it EADSR but reporting aggregate. So all the statistics diseases, they were the same. Like you have it in the HMIS as uh, EADSR, but reported as aggregate. So what the EADSR came to do, the improvement was only like to take for those 26 priority diseases uh, to make them as a case-based. So means like everything which you have uh, previously, you have it. Only that uh, for the 26, the the aggregation is a little bit different because you are reporting them as case-based, but for the seven which was remaining, you just like the same mapping, like the same data element from the HMS was being used in the um, EADSR for them to be able to report. So they are the same 36 for, uh, for the IDSR. Um, and then uh, the second was on the, yes. So the way the EADSR function for the immediate, the first reporter suspect, uh, this report a suspect, once it is suspected, uh, like we have this disease, then that goes to the next level, which is a district. The district people come to do uh, verification, uh, to do the investigation. Once they verify and, um, and confirm that this is this particular disease, then it is confirmed. So they have both suspect and also confirmed, depending on the investigation which has been done. So at first it goes as suspect, but then when the investigation is done, um, lab test is being done and then confirmed, you have both um, uh, suspect and confirmed. So for those which if they confirmed, it's confirmed. Uh, for those which they haven't done the investigation, it should be, it's continue to be suspect. Yeah, thank you. And also we'll have a brief session after this. Uh, we will we'll be able to have questions. Thank you. Can I use this one? This one? Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, allow me to share with you my, our experience in Rwanda, uh, linking up uh, two systems, the civil registration and vital strategic system, statistics system, uh, and our uh, routine immunization digital registry uh, to improve uh, the health services, especially uh, trying to uh, have better coverage and also equity of service in the health facilities uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, a project uh, came in just to uh, to for the country to to reach the global health coverage by ensuring that all uh, newborn in rwanda uh, got the vaccination services and we don't have uh, uh, those who can miss uh, doses and support so as a quick background for Rwanda, uh, Rwanda is one of the early adopting countries for the DHIS as a for routine uh, health formation system, uh, whereby as we talk, uh, the system covers private and public, uh, all programs integrated into one uh, HMS system. Uh, that happened since 2012, but uh, towards uh, 2019, uh, a new idea when this uh, electronic immigration registry uh, package was developed. So the API program ought to have this digital solution to uh, support uh, 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 the, uh, digitization of children information, especially 
uh, throughout the routine vaccination schedule. Uh, so that includes uh, no more routine vaccination, but also the HPV vaccine administration. Uh, as also we talk then, so technology keep on improving in 2020, uh, the government of Rwanda opted to have a digital CRV system. This is a, a homegrown uh, software developed uh, at the country level to capture uh, civil status and health events. Uh, that has been rolled out nationwide to uh, administrative and uh, health facilities. As uh, you know, uh, vaccination services are being uh, are being uh, are being done uh, in the health centers in Rwanda, and I think that's uh, how it's done uh, uh, across uh, in other countries. And also, uh, uh, most of uh, in Rwanda, uh, the ninety five percent busts are happening in the health facilities. So this. Uh, uh, to some extent, uh, the bus that is being done at the facilities, the, the, the big percentage, and also the vaccination services are being administered as services. So uh, integrating these two systems uh, uh, was seen as a, a strategy to make sure that we improve the coverage. Talking about the ER assist, uh, the electronic immunization system in Rwanda, and also the vaccination services in general. Uh, Rwanda is not a big country, but we expect approximately 370,000 children in the program per annum. Uh, and the uh, electronic registry uh, was rolled out countrywide in all vaccination posts, uh, approximately uh, 515 uh, health centers using the registry. So as you know, a child is supposed to be, comes to the health facility as we fill out the normal paper registry. So a typical digital registry has been put in place to, uh, to, to support the process. As I said, 94% uh, deliveries uh, happen in the health facilities uh, based on DHS uh, uh, 1920. And also uh, be, uh, based on the same uh, survey, 96% uh, of children age of that eight month uh, receive or basic vaccination from the health post or from the health services, health facilities, sorry. So uh, since all health facilities are supposed to fill out paper registries and also electronic registries, so as you understand, it's more time consuming and uh, uh, duplication of efforts. So in 2020, borrowing a reef from what happened during COVID, where about the Ministry of Health has experienced the immediate digital registration of, uh, of COVID cases uh, using DHIS, they thought, why not try the same for, 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 for routine immunization and go paper S to ensure that uh, uh, clinical staff at the health facility can focus more on uh, on delivering services and use uh, uh, DHIS as a digital registry for the vaccination services and records events uh, of, for every va va vaccination visit uh, done by parents. Uh, talking about the CRVS, uh, as I said, the CRVS ideas came in by in 2020. Uh, of course, as I said, uh, this is was to increase the birth registration and death certification to 95% and uh, to 90 for death certification uh, by 2025. That it is, this is the global uh, target uh, for the country. So the CRVS uh, digital solution came in to uh, help the country to keep track of progress, but also to support and improve services. So among all the steps for this CRVS, uh, this is just like to give you an overview of how the CRVS works. Uh, the, the system development took these three steps and covered almost uh, 416 uh, uh, civil registrar at the health sector, means, like, means the children who are born in the community can still be registered at the, at the sector's office, but those who are born in the health facility, uh, around uh, 6, 12 uh, civil registered health facilities also been trained to 
report children uh, born in the health facilities. As you understand, uh, the same, uh, whether civil registration is happening at the health facility and also the vaccination services are happening in the in the health facilities. So as we talk uh, in your upper right, you can see in your in your right, you can see the phases and the uh, events uh, uh, digitalized and how it started. So in 2020, that's when uh, the birth and death registration pack module uh, was brought in, and which has triggered an idea of starting thinking of how can we link these two systems to uh, to reduce the workload, but also because the CRV system provides the national identification number for under 16. So that was also another opportunity to leverage on so that uh, we can easily identify uh, newborn uh, and also reuse the information from uh, the system uh, since uh, birth and uh, vaccination services are happening at the health facility. Uh, so how did we uh, 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 thought of uh, implementing this? As you understand, uh, the, the our digital our digital immunization registry was built on the HIS. Of course, it has a profile page where you record names and inf child information, but we didn't have. Uh, of course, the DHS can offer possibility of having the unique ID, but that unique ID wasn't cross cutting or other government systems. So using the, the CRV system to use, uh, because like when a child is born in this facility, parents are required to feed uh, children ch child information, names, uh, names, details, parents information, uh, loc uh, location, and, and so forth. But, but also still have that national identification number for the child. Uh, to do that interoperability, we 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 thought a situation whereby uh, data are going to be fed from uh, uh, the CRV system and be uh, 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 brought to DHIS instance, but we thought it would be an, a good idea to have, if I can say, a similar uh, 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 a similar registry in DHIS, just like as a staging as a staging program to be able to have like a a quick check to see if all information the CRVs are, are transferred from one point to another. So uh, part of the information that we, had, we, we transferred from uh, the CRVs are of course uh, a person, uh, profile data, and also the national identification number, which is unique for every newborn in, the, in Rwanda. Of course, this information uh, during the registration pro, pro, uh, part, the, the nurse vaccinating a child simply has to uh, search through our DHIS. I, I think uh, you know you are familiar with DHIS, search from that registry and retrieve the information. So by retrieving a child, uh, the child comes with all demographic information. And from there, he continues with registering uh, visits and the rest of information as uh, uh, the child is. Uh, brought back for vaccination services. So after doing that implementation, so the aim of this, uh, 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 the purpose of this was, to, we, the purpose of this assessment was to, to ensure that we've done our our scripting, we are making sure that data are, are, are moving from one side to another, but we want to be sure that how our, our quality our data we are getting from the Sierra uh reaches to our DHIS instance. So we 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 have selected number of some of the indicators uh, just to uh, to help us to monitor uh, by doing the daily counting of. Uh, and comparing like if information uh, pushed from one side to another, but also comparing what uh, has been reported in the monthly report, because by that time we didn't have, well, the country hasn't stopped yet the HMIS aggregate reporting, because in the ag HMIS aggregate, we have already a section for vaccination where they report on a monthly basis uh, uh, 
uh, those uh, children who received uh, or those administered by, uh, by, by reports on vaccination services. So among the, the, the variable we, we looked at is the total, num the total deliveries that are reported in HMIS and live bus from the health facilities in the HMIS. And also we looked at what the number of bus registered in Sierra VS and those were transferred to our DHIS instance, to our, to our DHIS staging, st staging uh, registry uh, before we start recording uh, or even enrolling the char a child into the, our, into the, the immunization registry. Uh, this is uh, we 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 added on like uh, the BCG registered in the immigration registry. It means like after retrieving information or pushing information from the Sierra VS and enrolling a child in the vaccination program, we also went ahead and uh, through a program indicator generate uh, this value on monthly. But, but, but we 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 are a bit interested to see on monthly basis how many children have been uh, uh, vaccinated, for example, for BCG, because this BCG indicates that it was to some of the, our analysis being used as a proxy denominator when it comes to coverage. So we just in the case, some who prefer using BCG as a denominator and in our uh, immunization registry, how is it, what the number we have so that we can easily uh, address also the denominator uh, uh, obstacles that uh, program have been facing. So as I said, the uh, part of the methodology, we, of course, we developed a script that, uh, of course, uh, on daily basis, uh, that pushes data from the Sierra VS and also create a staging bus registry in our DHS assistance and also uh, retrieve or review monthly aggregate data vaccination, routine uh, aggregate data from the routine immunization services, and also monitor on monthly basis children recorded in the routine in our digital immunization registry, and then perform some quality checks and of course document on to see how our, our, the, the, our interoperability layer is performing and is doing the job. Some of uh, uh, the findings that, uh, of course, we we we, we done a number of uh, checks, but uh, here for the sake of this part presentation, we did uh, this exercise uh, last year in March, trying to see, uh, uh, of course, how far we are we are with the government with the national target of having. 95% uh, Sierra Vest bus registered by 25, by 2025. So as you can read from this uh, bus registration, you can see the total deliveries we have in HMIS, there are 29,000. This is the monthly data. Uh, and we had by that time 28,900 uh, children registered. So you see there, there were some, uh, still some discrepancy. Uh, because by that time, that's when the Sierra Vista was introduced, but also uh, that's also the time that also started checking, see, uh, is Sierra Vista good enough to, to replace the aggregate? And when you look at the live bath uh, from the health facility, this is the, the uh, 29,554. But when you look at the uh, in our registry, the interoperability uh, uh, the, what has been pushed by that time in Sierra Vest, you know, from Sierra Vest to our data assistance, you find there are still a very big gap because like it was like uh, it, by trying to see how our interoperability layer is quality is, is doing quality works to have uh, similar data on both sides. So there were some technical uh, transfer issues, especially from, uh, from CRVS to DHIS. Of course, but you can, you can see from the CRVS, the registration of newborn, uh, the quality of data is quite high, uh, is quite high, but despite we have uh, less data in our DHIS instance. So, 
uh, last year towards the end of year so the, we had the ministerial order enforcing uh, going paperless for all health facilities in Rwanda that to some extent has uh, uh, and whereby all health facilities were required to to first of all register each child before administering vaccine of course if you don't have your national id number they still register you and vaccinate but one of uh, there has been a change in the process of uh, delivering or of, uh, of delivering vaccination services and that has come to some extent uh, having quality data you can as you can read from the 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 orange the or the, the orange bars uh some pre, uh, big improvement has been uh, achieved uh, even though there are still some uh, some gap uh for example looking at uh, the number of uh, people registered children registered in the service has increased but and also when you look at the number of uh, uh here i'm not sure if this mouse oh where is it pointing okay uh so when you look at uh, uh the, the Sierra Vesti registered bus and also uh, the DHIS bus pushed from Sierra Vesti to DHIS, you find there is a quite big number of improvement, but still there are some challenges, uh, some missing information that to some extent affect the services because to be able to vaccinate the child, it has to, that the child has to be registered, has to be in the system or you, so that you can use, utilize the NIN provided for a gate from the CRVS. Uh, part of the challenge, of course, uh, apart from, because when you are, you are having that interoperability area, when there is a network issue, maybe in between during synchronization, something can happen, data don't synchronize, uh, don't go uh, as you wish. But also we have some organizational unity mismatch among the two systems. Some new facilities may be introduced or even uh, uh, you find organic do, don't doesn't exist at all. So uh, those are some of the challenges that we say. So when that they don't exist and the system pushes, so data is is automatically lost. Uh, as a conclusion, uh, we have seen uh, that this interoperability to some extent is uh, facilitating registration and follow up of children despite the challenges mentioned. And uh, uh, as we talk, 99% of children are uh, registered in uh, service automatically available for uh, our electronic musician registry for routine musician services and uh, follow-up visits. Of course, uh, that also to some extent helps to identify uh, zero dose children and also locate those who, who have missed some doses. Uh, and also, uh, it, it, it's, I can't say it, it has solved like, the dominator issue, but to some extent, it's helping us to see uh, the gap, especially if you decide to use the BCG as the dominator, we decide to use, uh, because we have all, almost 90% 90 of children of newborn in our system. So we, depending on projected population based on the census, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a choice. Of course, some improvements are still uh, recommended. Uh, thank you very much for, for your time. Yeah, and uh, questions. Yeah, thank you, Adolf. And uh, we have all these presentations on the website. So you can easily be able to access them and uh, actually download and go through them. But we have some four minutes remaining for any quick questions uh, that we may be there. Uh, from the start, we looked from how uh, we were looking at the DHS2 and uh, how it relates to the country architectures. We started from, yeah, looking from the first presenter, how with the machine learning, how does it fit in? Then we went to regional program like ECOWAS. Then we went to a global program like PEFA. And then we were able to look at now the country specific implementations and the integration, like what he has just ended with the uh, the CRVS and also what uh, uh, he presented about the about the IDSR. So if you have any questions, let's uh, have the questions and then 
the team's going to respond. So I'll start with Samuel and then Bob. Thank you, Adolf. Um, I just wanted to ask, I saw in one of the challenges, you indicated that the script retrieves data every hour. I've just failed to see how it's a challenge, uh, but also would there, maybe if I'm to try to digest that, is it a performance issue? Is it that there's a real-time need of data from CRPS uh, to the destination system? Or have you guys looked at another alternative way to instead uh, push data into the destination system that you want data to go? So when I add a newborn baby in the, CR, in the CRFV uh, system, that the system pushes data in, in, instead of being retrieved. Over. Thank you for the sample. So we'll take a couple of them and then they can be responded together. Bob. Thanks, Dennis. And maybe it touches a little bit on what Stephen was asking as well. I, I think, Adolf, one of the really interesting things about the scenario that you described is maybe less about some of the technical details, but that is hard enough to do architecture within the Ministry of Health. But now you're talking about a different ministry. Right? CRVS, presumably that's, that's home affairs or, or, or something similar. They're curious to know what is the negotiation process been like? How do you how do you work out things like the data sharing agreements, even mundane details like data formats and things like that, when you have to negotiate across ministries rather than just within Ministry of Health? Thank you, Bob. So I don't know whether we have any other questions. So I'll let him respond. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much. Maybe let me start by Stephen. Uh, is it concern or clarification? So when it comes to the challenges, uh, the, the CRV system, as I said, it's a it's 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 a locally developed or homegrown solution supporting the CRV processes. So uh, the way the interoperability is done, so they have API. Uh, that we exploit to uh, to push data to our DHIS registry. So it's not actually we are going to fetch from the CRVs automatically on a given uh, 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 plan or plan job uh, that are pushed or, or after every two hours, data is being pushed to from the CRVs to our DHIS uh, staging uh, program. Well, and then from the that digital staging program, that's where every time when a nurse administrating for the first time, for, for the first time, he has to, he or she has to, to search from that staging uh, birth registry to register a child into the uh, immunization registry. That's actually how it's being done. So, but uh, trying to uh, maybe still on that, uh, since it's the government, it's a, it's, it's a government-owned system. They are the ones who, who are giving you options. So uh, they are actually because like it's a database that govern uh, the whole population registry. So they are the ones who are o giving you options on how data can be uh, pushed. But uh, uh, as you, uh, one of the newly uh, agreed. Uh, way of uh, having data is doing that, uh, live streaming of data, but it's something that uh, has been tested, but uh, not yet implemented. Talking about what Bob said, of course, uh, government to government institution, sometimes it's easy or difficult depending on who manages things. So you can't say it's always a straightforward process, but uh, in our case, because this was uh, actually a request for uh, the two programs. They were like, they were vaccination uh, program, but they also a unit in charge of uh, that, this certification. So they all wanted uh, data from the CRVs because uh, that's where you can have uh, birth, this information, this certification, and also birth. So, uh, we we uh, we have received the supporting data from the Minister of Health requesting 
that uh, that there are a bit of this transformation. Of course, the selection of uh, variables to be uh, to be pushed has to be where I think we, we did have like almost five 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 uh, letters requesting changes of API because every time there is a change in your API uh, list, so you need to have a letter expressing or like just find the needs of change. So that's how uh, maybe Andrew uh, is there. Thank you, Adolf. Actually, on the data sharing, what happened? The government appointed one institution. Want me to stand? Oh my goodness. Okay, good. Thank you. So the government appointed one entity called the National Identity Agency to coordinate the CRVS implementation. So there was a win-win. Because you know, for us in the Ministry of Health, we are in charge of health facilities. Then uh, for, for the live bus to be registered, they needed our policy to support. Then on the other side, we needed them to send us the live bus with their, they call it national identification number for us to be able to vaccinate. So that is what I always, Bob always emphasize on. When you know that you are gaining from integration of sectors, everyone will be involved. So there was that, uh, support me, I support you, then you implement. That's why the data sharing is not a problem. We are looking at the benefits of the citizens rather than the data sharing. Thank you. Yeah, it yeah, seems there is one burning question. So let me just allow him. He's from the Ghana ministry. Thank you. Just to add an additional perspective, we are doing a similar thing. In our case, we have, so it's a, a, a try. The Ghana Health Service, we have the National Identification Authority, and then the Birth and Death Registry. Now, we've experienced two sides of the coin, where the integration with the National Identification Authority was pretty smooth, and that of uh, integration between Ghana Health Service and the Birth and Death Registry, a lot of bottlenecks. One of the bottlenecks being contributed by the technical teams that were supporting these other government agencies. And so those are some of the things you are likely to face. So technically or at the managerial level, there might be these agreements to share data, but if the technical implementations, people are not in sync with the idea and what you all want to do, then you have other bottlenecks introduced and that just gets the whole uh, process slowed down. So it, it can be very complicated sometimes. So thank you. Let's appreciate our presenters. And uh, so, yeah, thank you all. Thank you all for joining. Yeah, and feel free to reach out to them yeah, through the different sessions. So thank you.